I'm here with a man who's ridden all the big championships, World Superbike, MotoGP, and BSB legends, leading the championship now. And uh, I'd like you to welcome Shaky Byrne. Shaky, um, can I ask you, how did you get started with motorbikes? You know, what was your first bike? How did you get into bikes? I think, um, you know, the funny thing is, I never dreamed of anything other than being a motorbike racer, uh, which may sound kind of crazy, but even at school when I was a young kid, you know, when you had the, you know, you go into the new class and the teacher would say, right, kids, we want to know your name, you know, we want to know what you do, what your hobbies are, and what you want to be when you when you leave school. Mine was always to be a motorbike racer. And I have absolutely no idea where it came from because, at, you know, my parents never even driven cars. You know, they had no driving license or nothing. So it was this real crazy, uh, you know, dream that I've had from, from the word go and it sounds corny and it sounds like something like yeah right okay you know you're going to say that because of this camera or whatever but it's the truth. Um, the real reason I, I started racing honestly is even more bizarre and that's just because I got banned from driving on the road by the police so um, it's not the, the, the best motorcycle of motorcycle on the road. Yeah on the car yeah oh, okay. but um, not the best of introductions to racing but that's, that's how it all panned out. Hey, what's the age when you started? Um, was it 19 years old, I think, yeah. 20 years old maybe, so, yeah. Can I ask, who were your heroes growing up, or was when you started racing, and you know, the first guys you had posters of on your bedroom wall? Definitely Kevin Schwantz, um, believe it or not, I watched you race your, uh, your Donington win, I was at that, awesome. that event, um, so 500s were always a big thing for me, um, you know. The days of, of Wayne and Kevin, Eddie, you know, you, all of the boys was just like a, for me, a golden era of, of motorcycle racing. The bikes were, you know, the bikes were something that, that nobody could even dream of getting close to. And, uh, you know, super bikes nowadays, you look at and you think, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's derived from a street bike and stuff, but it just kind of takes away the, the specialness, I think, of a, of a Grand Prix bike. I understand. Um, can you tell us your, I mean, you've had a big career. And uh, can you tell us your best memory so far, racing? No, really. Um, I always like to answer this question because I get asked something like that quite regularly, and I'd like to say, well, maybe it's never happened yet, you know. Um, because at the end of the day, you've, you've always got to be dreaming of uh, you know achieving more. And uh, the day that you sit there and you think, oh, you know, 2003, for instance, winning two World Superbike races, that was the best day ever, you know. So winning two superbike races is what you, you know, did you dream of just doing that or, you know, do you actually want to be a world champion? If you're it's not brilliant. dreaming of being a champion, then yeah, maybe it's time to stop, eh? That's a magic answer, man. Can I um, ask you the not so pleasant one, what's your worst memory in racing so far? Um, I guess, I guess my worst, uh, my worst memory is, is, is perhaps some of the options that I could have took, you know, from a career point of view that, um, you know, certainly later in your career, you look back and you think, oh, why did I do that? You know, maybe if I'd have done this different or I'd have gone to that championship or I'd have ridden that bike, you know, things could have been a bit different. But at the end of the day, you know, we can all dwell on, on things that, that we might have done wrong or things that might have happened that might be bad. But, you know, they, they detract from the things that could happen if you if you concentrate and work hard on going forward. And, and I like to try and stick to that for now. Fantastic, mate. Um, what do you do to disconnect from all the pressures and you know, or racing basically, what do you do, hobbies, training, what, you know, disconnect? I have two young children, <laughs> as you yeah. know that really, really helps, um, you know, that's, they're, they're, they're unbelievable, you know, like um, I remember some really, really tough times, you know, maybe in World Championship or something when, when things weren't going my way and, you know, you come in after a session and, you know, at the time I had a, a sort of year old son or whatever and it didn't matter. To, to that year old son what, what had happened or whether you were tenth or, or first or if you won a race or you finished last. You know, when you got back to the motorhome you were still dad and he was still pleased to see you and there was always a big smile. So children are a massive part of my life and you know I love them both dearly. Um, from a hobbies point of view, cycling I really, really enjoy. Um, pretty much anything with an engine. I'm, I'm you yeah. know, kind of the same as everybody. Um, I like flying helicopters. I can't afford to do it, but I enjoy doing it. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I've got, I've got plenty of little hobbies to keep me going. Cool. Um, Shaky, you've ridden all the championships, like I mentioned before, and you've ridden with all the, the good electronics, you've ridden without any, you know, back in the old days. Yeah, you've ridden with them, and now without, when I say without, you know, but with the controlled ECU. Can you elaborate on that? I would love to hear your take on electronics in our sport. 
I think honestly that um, you know, if you look back to the late nineties or, or early two thousands and stuff, when when there were no electronics on superbikes, you know, you you see uh, a standout rider. You know, they, it was obvious. You know, somebody was riding really really well. Somebody was doing something good. You know, you, you could see it. Um, I think that uh, obviously there has to be this 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 technical need for you know traction control and anti wheeling and spin control and all of this stuff, really? and you know. If it, if it kind of filters down the line and, and makes road bikes safer and gets more people on the road, then great. But, you know, for me, um, certainly when you look at World Superbike right now, I think that, you know, it's it, it kind of detracts a little bit from, from where I see racing needing to be. You come to a, to a BSB race now, um, nobody has no electronics, nobody has no anti-wheeling, nobody has no blipper system, nobody has anything. So. The only guys that are going to win races are the guys that are riding the bikes better than the other guys. And the great thing about BSB is that it's not just one manufacturer. So I can win races, you know, uh, BMW have won races, Kawasaki are winning races. Um, you know, lots of different manufacturers can win. Um, and it's because everything's so much more equal. You know, you're not going to go and take it to, to Kawasaki in, in, in World Superbike at the moment because their package over the course of a season is, is just a little bit stronger. Don't get me wrong, Tom and Johnny are great riders. Um, you know, both world champions, very, very, very strong. And, and for instance, Chaz can take it to him on the Ducati at certain tracks, um, you know, where the Ducati will work a little bit better and, and he can actually let them have it. But, you know, whether he can do it and, and consistently ride at that level over the course of a year, certainly this year, it's proven really, really tough. Yeah, so basically you're saying once you've got the electronic package there that's stronger than the other guys and you're riding it like Tom and, and uh, Johnny do, you're not going to beat them on, on a lesser package? Well, like I mean, if you look at, you know, for argument's sake, if you look at, um, if we look at World Superbike right now, you've got Tom and Johnny and they're both great guys, like I said, yeah. and they're both very, very strong. Um, but look where the next Kawasaki is, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not even in the same race. Um, you know, you might have the, the, the three Kawasaki's in our championship, and the guys are all within a tenth or two tenths of each other because they've all got the same the same thing. And that's not just the the, the JG guys. That's Luke Mossy or yeah. that's Philip Backland. You know, they can all be mm -hmm. that close because they've all got the same kind of stuff to deal with. But you know, it's not so much I think in World Superbike that the you know that the top teams have such a, a, a a wonderful package it's just they got very very clever people working on their packages and they got great riders giving them the feedback they need to you know to develop them further yeah, awesome can i change the subject a little bit but still on uh, on our sport and technology and, that, and that's con tires controlled tires um you've ridden in championships that run uh multiple brands you know and you've seen how it works there and now and then World Superbikes you rode with the control tyre, what's your take on that? The good or bad pros and cons? But. I think that, um, I think the control tyre thing works. Um, I think that it, it takes away a variable, you know, in a, in a rider's head, you need to know that you, you've done your job the best you could possibly do on a Friday and a Saturday, so that when you line up for, for your race on a Sunday, you, everything you've got from a, from a tyre point of view and the work you've done is, is exactly the same as, as the rest of the guys. So, you know, let's say for instance we had Dunlop and Michelin and, and Pirelli back in here again. You know, you don't want to line up on the grid thinking, well, you're never going to touch a guy on the Michelin because the yeah. Michelin's better. Or the Dunlop's so strong in the wet, you're never going to beat a Dunlop in the wet, blah, blah, blah. You know, you want to know that you're going to get on the grid and the work you've done is to, is to try and win the race, you know. So, I think that the, the control tyre thing is, is, is really, really good. I mean, obviously, you know, put the shoe on the other foot, and if you were the rider that was on the, the best tyre, um, and you knew it was the best tyre over the course of the season, you know, yeah. even if you'd not refined your setup absolutely perfectly, you're going to be sat on the grid with a bit of a smile on your face because yeah. you're going to be thinking, well, you're on, you know. yeah, you've got no chance anyway, you know, the yeah. tyres are too good. But I think the way we have it at the moment, even MotoGP, you know, um, all, of the, all of the bike championships on yeah. control tyres, I think it's, yeah. it's a good thing. Cool. Um, I wanted to finish up with. All you know now, you know, from your long career, if there was something you wish you knew in the beginning, you know, whether it's writing or mental, you know, what would you, what would you share with the young guys that, you know, you think is important, you wish you knew? 
I don't know if there's anything that I that I share as such. I think that you know I I still in in many ways feel like that young kid that had a dream to go and race a motorbike, and you know not many people's dream comes true. But if you work at it and you and you chip away and you give everything you've got to to making that dream come true, then you know there's every chance it can happen. And nobody can ever say to me, oh, you know that's a, you know that's just a saying. You know it's not the truth because it happened for me. Um, I sold everything I owned to buy my first race bike. Um, you know, I had to, to go and work on the London Underground to earn enough money to go racing and, and you know, I, I built this dream and, and, and developed this dream and, and, and still dream that dream now, you know. So I think the the only the only advice that you could maybe give is to is to just not look at the end of your nose, you know, you've got to look at a, a sort of bit of a bigger picture and you know, the few times in my career where I just thought, no, that's the way forward and, you know, went with it and maybe wish now that I didn't. So it's always taking Taking the time to to properly assess your opportunities and making sure that you know whatever opportunity you do get, you can make the most of. Shaky, absolute pleasure to talk to you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.